Fair warning, I'm coughing all over the place. I don't have COVID. I've just got some crud in my throat, but bear with me because like General George S. Patton, one of my historical heroes, I'm just going to freaking fight through it, okay? Just deal, deal with me. <clears throat> We're going to go over a little bit about antiquities. What are antiquities? The study of the ancient world, uh, basically from, um, hold on, let me X this out. Basically the study of the ancient world, but not limited to, including, but not <clears throat> limited to history. Right, history is the study of the stories and the people of the past, usually through written text. Right, and from an anthropological standpoint, somebody who studies anthropology, uh, humankind, this would be history. The histories would be actually only one part of anthropology, right? And that is the written text. We call this philology, the study of their written text. What did they write about themselves? What did they write about their opponent, their enemies? What did their enemies write about them? What about their trading partners? What was written down to affirm these stories? That's philology. But there's other aspects of antiquities. Um, the study of their artifacts, right? The, the, an artifact, by definition, has to be portable. You can move it around. This would include pottery, weapons, um, all sorts of things like that. Pottery, weapons, jewelry. Uh, that would be archaeology. If it's something that's attached to, like, a temple that can't be moved, um, or no, that's called an artifact, I'm sorry. If it's attached, like, a pillar or an altar, that's a column, an altar that's, attached to a temple, we call that a feature and not an artifact. It still tells us something about the past. So combining the written text, the philology, or aka the histories, history, with the archaeology, the study of what is excavated, taken out of the earth, um, can, and ethnography, talking to the people in the area, getting to know their, their oral histories and how they talk, um, and the study of their coins. This is called numismatics, right? Someone who collects coins is called a numatist. Um, you know, they could be American coins with the American president, George Washington on the, um, I'm sorry, Abraham Lincoln on the penny, uh, Thomas Jefferson on the nickel, um, uh, I believe it's FDR on the dime, uh, John F. Kennedy on the, that's, those are American coins. But there's ancient coins with Roman Caesars on them, <clears throat> right? I'm talking about the word Caesar means later. It literally just means leader. And from the word Caesar in the classical Latin, uh, Caesar and the Catholic, you get these words like Kaiser, which will be used as the leader of Germany later, and Tsarya or Tsar in Russian, the Taparovsky Yazik, da? The Slov in Russian is uh, Tsar, it means leader, right? Tsar means leader, Kaiser means leader, they both come from Caesar. When you know your antiquities, you understand how these branch out. All right, <clears throat> so antiquities, um, but the ancient world, right? Going from the fall of Rome all the way the other direction. After Rome falls, we enter theoretically what is called the Middle Ages or the Dark Ages, which are neither term which I like for several historical reasons. Number one, the Middle Ages assumed that it kind of had nothing but being a middle period that stuck in between glorious Rome and the antiquities, the glorious antiquities, and the early modern period. There is a lot that happened in the Middle Ages from the rise of Islam to the uh, uh, <clears throat> Holy Roman Empire to... Um, all sorts of things, right? There's trade, there's invention uh, in the in the East, there's um, the preservation of texts, so um, there's the improvement of inventions through the monasteries, there's the spread of knowledge uh, in the world. Anyway, so Dark Ages assume that nothing good was happening, right? Like all the lights went out after Rome fell. Well, go to the Greek-speaking East, you'll find that that's not the truth either. <clears throat> so anyway, those terms just stuck. <clears throat> We're going to start a little bit of antiquities. It's a hobby of mine, <clears throat> as everything is. Let's start, first of all, on the screen you see <clears throat> where I'm sitting here. Got to do, do the Cobra Kai. Never dies. This pottery back here <clears throat> in the picture, <clears throat> excuse me, that's called an amphora. All right, there's several types of Greek pottery. Now, the ancient Greeks wouldn't have called themselves Greeks. They would have called themselves the Hellens or the Ellens, right? You'll see Elas, right? Hellenic world, Hellenic world, okay? Greeks is an anachronistic term. It means we use it now, but we throw it backwards. <clears throat> This pottery was used to store wine. It's called an amphora. That particular one was probably in the 6th century BC, which we're talking about the 500s, in the area around Athens, that whole stretch of land, <clears throat> the mainland. It's called Attic Pottery. This is red figure. It's, it's black. What it is is you make the pottery from terracotta. The word terra means earth. It's where we get the word terra, terrain, terrestrial, territory. <clears throat> so a terracotta in archaeology, it's made from the earth. Right, so you're gonna have that red clay. Well, then they're gonna burn it in a fire that makes it black, and then you're gonna scratch off the black in that sort of a negative image to get that image. Very cool, right? <clears throat> that particular piece of pottery was used for storing wine, uh, whereas to other ones like the kilix, you'll see a small cup, flat with two 
uh, handles. That's a drinking cup. Use with two hands. And the big ones were a crater. They were used for mixing. You'll have an onoike, which is like a pitcher used for pouring wine. So when you look at a vast array, a plethora <clears throat> of Greek pottery, Hellenic pottery, each one of them has a specific um, a specific function. This up here is, of course, Leonardo da Vinci, some of his sketchings. I just like that. And I got a bunch of history videos down here. All right. <clears throat> I apologize for the copying. I'll have to break this up and pause. This is one of my favorite pictures, okay? This picture was taken at the University, the Oriental Institute of Chicago, all right? This is one of the best ancient Near Eastern history museums, like, in the world. Not just in the, in the country, but in the world. <clears throat> that beast that you see there, and I'm going to zip out of here. Um, that beast right there is called a Lamas, uh, Lamasu. If it's singular, it's Lamasu. <clears throat> If it's plural, it's Lamasi. Uh, this is actually from the Assyrian Empire, I believe the Neo-Assyrian Empire. Um, this one is a 40-ton winged bull. This is the face of the king. This one, I believe, belonged to um, Sargon II. And then later the palace was taken by his son and um, uh, the successor of Sennacherib, who was considered to be one of the most cruel people, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, in history and then you know you'll find this a lot this is the face of the king the horns on his um helmet are a symbol of royal power these guarded the palace gates all right this was 40 tons if you looked at it close you'll see the little cuneiform very clean cut cuneiform in there and um <clears throat> the wedge shaped writing uh but it's not sumerian do not get sumerian and akkadian mixed up sumerian is a language that has no known uh, linguistic relatives, none, that we, at least that we know of. Um, but that same style of fonts, those, a lot of those same cuneiforms are going to be adapted into a totally different linguistic system called uh, Akkadian that you're going to find later. You've heard of Sargon of Akkad, conquers Mesopotamia. This Akkadian is going to become what we call a lingua franca or a main language that's going to spread throughout the area and sort of unify these little kingdoms, right? They're going to borrow some of that old Sumerian cuneiform, but that's going to, the older forms are going to be used mostly later in what we call southern Babylonian dialects. And the northern Assyrians will keep a little of that and then start developing their own. That's a little bit more cleaner uh, in its form and a little simpler uh, than the southern Babylonians. This thing weighed 40 tons when it was excavated in the modern day country of Iraq, which is where all these Assyrian empires would be. Um, it was actually donated by the uh, Iraqi government to the museum, but they had it in fragments. It was so big and heavy, they had to bring it into the pieces, assemble it, and build uh, the museum around it. It looks like there's four legs. There's actually another one hidden over there. There's five. It's an optical illusion. So if you're standing at its side, it makes it look like you're walking with it. And if you see it from the front, it looks like it's guarding the palace. They are meant to be menacing. And according to their beliefs, they were the protectors of the city. All right. Now I'm going to have to do this again. All right. The next one. <clears throat> again, first three are from the Oriental Institute of Chicago. This is a basic mummy. I don't know what <clears throat> period it's from. I'm looking at some of this at the top, and it looks like it might be during the Greek period. I don't want to, um, <clears throat> you know, don't quote me on that, but I'm looking at some of the design on the top. It looks a little bit more Greek in its style from what I can see. Uh, this is one of my favorite pieces of all time. This, okay. I don't know what your beliefs are, but you cannot deny that Nebuchadnezzar of the Bible was actually a very historical person. People will say, no, you're just making that up. Nothing that's true that's written in that book. Well, uh, I think the London, um, I think the uh, British Museum would beg to differ with you. We have, <clears throat> we have uh, um, cylinder seals, which are like, uh, they're like clay cylinders, and they're usually like in like prisms with like different like um, five pointed, like I'd have to show you in a picture. There's called prisms. They're like a roll of, um, well, mud that's um, that's folded into a, a sort of a cylinder uh, with some edges on it, and then they inscribe cunea form, which means cunea means wedge shaped, right? Cunea form, the form of wedges. Uh, they would inscribe uh, royal decrees into these things, and then it would dry. We have cylinders from Nebuchadnezzar, right? We have civil, uh, cylinders from Nebuchadnezzar. We have mud bricks with Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, the whole Ishtar gate built by Nebuchadnezzar, or at least his palace. It might have been his father, Nabopolassar, who built it. I'd have to double check myself. Forgive my ignorance. Uh, these were on the gates. Okay, the whole Ishtar gate, the front gate of the city of Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar is preserved in the Pergamon Museum in Berlin. This is one fragment of what they would call the processional way. Now, 
if you believe in or you know of the Bible stories where the Israelites were captured and taken into Babylon, which archaeologists have proven that pretty much happened when they excavated um, parts of the city and found Babylonian arrowheads and, and burn marks where, according to the story, it was sacked and burnt. Uh, we, can, we can prove that. Uh, this is one of the fragments that was from the processional gate of Nebuchadnezzar. Now, this is a lion, uh, but the Akkadian word is labum, and the older Akkadian, or labu, if you take the newer version. Uh, there were three main symbols on the Ishtar gate, if I were to show you. There's a lion, a snake dragon. It's like a four-footed, like, almost looks like a dinosaur. And then there's a bull. Now, there's the labu in Akkadian, which symbolized uh, the, the feminine goddess Ishtar, equivalent of the Sumerian Inanna, right? This sort of shining one or goddess of fertility. Uh, the snake dragon, Mushushku, uh, actually symbolized um, the male principle of the god Marduk. Now, a lot of times you'll hear people on the line, because they watch a lot of television shows and a lot of Netflix and hear a lot of Bill Maher, they'll say that the book of Genesis copied, um, you know, the story of Marduk in Babylon. There is no way any scholar of antiquities would take that possible. The stories are nothing alike. They have nothing even remotely similar. And on top of that, Marduk is a much later development in Babylon. Uh, than the older of Babylonian texts, right? Uh, he's a later development. He's sort of a parallel. Uh, you have the Babylonians, the Syrians. They shared a lot of the same cultures. Uh, the principal god of Babylon, Babylon during that time would have been Marduk, and he's symbolized by the snake dragon. And um, the principal god uh, of Assyria would be the god Ashur, which was like a war god. And Ashuria, Assyria, is where we get their name, right, from that. <clears throat> anyway, this whole thing was made of mud bricks, uh, the third symbol was a bull or a biru, a young bull, which symbolized the royal power of the king himself. All right. Love this one. This is actually, yes, exactly who you think it is. It's King Tutankhamun, son of Akhenaten, the heretic god that rejected the gods of Egypt and worshipped only the sun, the Atan, who moved with the capital to, what we, um, to Amarna. We call this the whole period in Egyptology, uh, the Amarna period. Um, uh, Anyway, because he moved the capital. Well, it is believed by most Egyptologists that uh, Tutankhamun, a.k.a. Tut, was actually his son. It, uh, but he was, it, it could have been a son of another, uh, what is Akhenaten or Amenhotep III, I believe. That, that's debated. But most scholars believe it was Akhenaten, and it was the son of his secondary wife, Tia, not his primary wife. All right, because there was, um, they had multiple wives. Uh, this was actually excavated uh, from the uh, site, uh, I'm trying to remember which site it was, it was around where Tut was, but King Tut was so popular because he was unpopular. What I mean by that was he was a boy king, he didn't rule very long, he was trying to reverse all the things that his father Akhenaten had done, and but he died in his younger years, so he hadn't accomplished a whole lot. Because of this, he wasn't given a very big tomb, he got a very small tomb, everything was still intact, and so when everybody was robbing the other tombs in the Valley of the Kings, uh, they kind of threw the dirt over King Tut's uh, tomb and just buried it up. Kind of forgot about it until Howard Carter in 1922 excavates it. And then that's where you have his classic lines. I see things, wonderful things. Remember, the pyramids were these big structures supposedly meant to resurrect um, the pharaohs of Egypt. The pharaohs, the Egyptians hardly use the word pharaoh. They usually use the word Neb, which means lord, or Nebu was lords in the plural, right? Uh, pharaoh means great house, which is like a ruling family or a dynasty. And the word dynasty comes from the Greek word dunimis, which means power, not to be confused with Kratia, right? The Greek where we get democracy, demoskratia. Anyway, so here's King Tut, basically, in all his shining glory. Um, uh, so people would rob the pyramids, right? Pyramids stood between the fourth and the sixth dynasty. The first pyramid was built in the third dynasty under um, um, Djoser and his uh, architect Im Imhotep. Uh, but he was probably inspired by uh, another pharaoh whose name skips me. Casa Kemwe. Casa Kemwe, who started these, building these mounds a little bit bigger than the typical mound. And so that might have influenced the stack pyramid and then the whole thing. But the, the Sixth Dynasty is pretty much where the pyramids start going out. Number one, they were getting robbed left and right. So they decided to move the pharaohs to be buried in the Valley of the Kings, believing that they'll be safe from robbers. Nope. No home, no home uh, security there. They get robbed too. Tut gets left behind. So he's got all the cool stuff in it. All right. Anyway, that's it. Again, Oriental Institute of Chicago. All right. Let me see if I can move on. All right, this one is cool. It's one of my favorites. Same museum, Oriental Institute. This is one of the a big bullhead, a uh, symbol of, again, royal power, worldly royal power. This is from the king at Persepolis. Persepolis would have been uh, the palace. Persepolis sounds real, 
something like cool and sexy, Persepolis, but it's actually just the Greek word, Persa or Parsi or Farsi, Persa Polis. What do you know about the word polis in Greek? It means the city, a polis, politics, policemen, uh, political, right? Taking a poll, right? Persa Polis, Persepolis, all right? It was built in a troll, slips me. Uh, it wasn't by Cyrus. Cyrus lived uh, elsewhere. I believe he's in Pasagard. Um, and then the, the, the capital moved to Susa, which is old uh, Elam. And then this one came from uh, this in this palace. Uh, this would have number one been the palace where Esther, Queen Esther of the Bible, actually lived in this palace. And this is the same palace that was set on fire by Alexander the Great. Now, historians debate why he set that on fire. Was he really going vindictively to destroy the Persians for what they did? to the Hellenic world, because Alexander was known for not destroying too many things. I mean, when he went into Tyre, he wrecked that place because they resisted him. But most places he kind of left alone and said, okay, I'm Alexander the Great. You know how it always goes with these people. I rule over this and would leave him alone. So why did he set this on fire? Was it revenge? But some other stories say that one night he was hanging out with a bunch of ladies and they got drunk. They all got drunk and he went crazy and set it on fire. So I don't know. We don't know. I don't know if we'll ever know, but there's some debate on that was in scholarly circles. All right. This is from the Mayan period. I believe classical Mayan period. This is at the different museum. This is the museum of uh, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania, UPenn, University of Pennsylvania in, um, let me X this out, University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. One of my favorite museums. They remodeled it since I've been there years ago. I'd like to see the Assyriology and Sumeri Sumerology um, section this is classical mayan there's different periods of the americas archaeology of the americans americas by the way you can actually if you look close not in the picture but if you're there you can actually see some of the mayan hieroglyph and i did study a few books on actually how to uh read hieroglyphs i'm not an expert in hieroglyphs but they work on a, a what we call not an alphabet but a syllabary uh which are a, a chunk of consonant vowel groups represented by symbols and can have a meaning in and of themselves, but when put together, have a, a phonetic meaning. Very, very similar to uh, Akkadian. But since I had studied Akkadian, I had studied uh, Middle Assyrian uh, and later Assyrian, which was a little bit harder. Since I studied those, I already knew how to read a syllabary. I, I understood the concept. So when I was reading the Mayan and figuring out how, how to actually go through each symbol and read the um, uh, syllabary, it wasn't that foreign to my mind because it was the same principle as ancient Assyrian. Okay, this is classic. This is classic. Hold on, where am I? Where's my bit cam? Um, oh, here we go. This is a, this is a golden head or, or probably a gilded, right? You know, the head may not be solid gold. It probably isn't. It probably is wood. And then with gilded around it with gold, which is the way a lot of these um, uh, things work. Uh, this is the head of an instrument, a musical instrument, a stringed instrument. Um, not a zither, not really a heart. That, again, that's a term that we wouldn't really want to use. You could say a lyre, if you will, but a lyre is a Greek term. Um, so for all intents and purposes, we'll just call it a lyre, string instrument, you play it similar to a heart. And it has the winged bull representing the king. Now, there's some debate on this, too, because people say, well, that's a, that's a bull. That is clearly a bull. Other people say because of the beard, it's actually a, a bison, that they actually had bison in that area at that time, which are extinct. Now, that's not that unbelievable because lions used to be in the um, ancient Near East. You'd hear, read about them all the time in the Bible. Oh, I don't believe the Bible. Okay, fine. Well, then look at the Assyrian um, Assyrian reliefs and Baal Talia reliefs on the walls, right? Uh, you'll always see king Assyrian kings hunted lion, hunting lions. In fact, that's why there's no more lions. They said the Assyrians hunted them to death because killing this, the lion was a symbol of royal power in their own eyes. Uh, some people believe that might be a, a buffalo. The other might be like on the Ishtar Gate we talked about, that the bull was still seen as a royal symbol of the king, and the beard represents that long beard that the king had. So, again, this is one that is uh, sort of debated. All right, like this one too. Let me, uh, this is the Roman Gladius, right? Uh, this is obviously a replica because that's made out of steel, and you've got the. Um, um, you get the guard here. Uh, this is actually steel, not iron. Uh, and so these are all copies and replicas, but it was fun to hold. It's kind of heavy. It's the Roman sword was meant for slashing. 
uh, when the Roman legions would use them when they would march, right? They would mostly stay shield to shield and use their spears. You didn't want to get separated from your rank and file and have to use a sword. But if you did and you were in close quarters combat, that's when you bring out the gladius for the slashing. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, that is where the word gladiator comes from. I would like to add a couple things about the movie Gladiator. Yes, I'm a fan. No, nothing about that is remotely accurate. Number one, the movie makes it look like, oops, Marcus Aurelius did not want his son to be emperor, and the son really, really did. It was actually the opposite. Marcus Aurelius wanted his son to be emperor, and the son wanted nothing to do with it. He was insane, though, and he ultimately did become emperor, and he fought in the uh, Roman Colosseum, probably controlled several times, and he walked around in a lion's um, uh, head robe claiming to be Heracles, Hercules, and ultimately I believe he was assassinated. Was it by poison? I know that Caligula was actually murdered by his own Praetorian guard. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. This little sword back here was actually a prop in the actual movie Ben-Hur in the 1960s, I believe, with Charlton Heston, so that's kind of cool. Okay, back to that one. All right, here's another Sphinx. Well, Sphinx. Again, University of Pennsylvania. I know they redid this room. I haven't been there uh, for a while. Uh, this is the third largest Sphinx in the Western Hemisphere. The face is actually uh, flat and taken off by, it's been sandblasted by the winds of the Sahara Desert. How cool is that, right? You'll see the cartouches here, which are the Egyptian hieroglyph uh, written into, and uh, these are symbols of Egyptian royalty. When I was in that museum, I had taken an online course in Egyptology through Coursera called Introduction to Egyptology. Learned a lot from the course, and it was taught by one of the top Egyptologists in the world by the name of David Silverman here out of the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, one of his protégés was actually working security. He was working for the university and just, just now graduated, and he was teaching me actually how to read some of that hieroglyph. Over here you see the uh, Horus, the god Horus with the double crown, right? The northern lower kingdom up here, these, these uh, columns are lotus flowers, some are open, some are closed. So he was teaching me about some of this. I know this is, it was a showroom for them for a long time. By the way, Benjamin Franklin founded this university and uh, Thomas Jefferson founded the University of Virginia, which has one of the top law schools. Um, okay, this is really cool. I don't, is that me? Oh, maybe that is me. Yeah, I'm trying to think, it looks like me. This is actually the Parthenon in Nashville, not the one in Greek. This one was a, a replica that was made for like, I believe a world fair. And it was so impressive. They, uh, they just decided to keep it. They literally just decided to keep it. Oh, hold on. And inside, I'll show you in a minute. Okay, you have on the outside, you have the frieze up here. You have, um, yeah, I believe this is Athena. Uh, Zeus, she's being crowned by Nike, the goddess of victory, as the patron city. In the myth, she has a contest uh, against Poseidon. He offers a fountain. She offers an olive tree. And then they build a temple around the olive tree with goddess figures called the Erectathon. You have the Parthenon, which means place of the virgin, literally in uh, um, Greek. It was, uh, well, it was commissioned by Pericles, the Athenian statesman, but in a dubious way where, you know, he claimed to be championing democracy, but the Greeks, the Hellens, had come across some silver mines, right? I'm part of their country. I believe it was on main, the mainland. And uh, there was some debate in the city political debate on whether that silver should be spent on raising uh, soldiers' salaries or building this temple. Most people, I believe, sided with the salaries, but Pericles kind of um, used the money to build this temple to Athena anyway. Oops. Politician, politician, politician. Ultimately, he was ostracized for the city, uh, you know, because they had a vote. Uh, he was probably, not for that reason, he was coming maybe too powerful, um, too, too threatening to the people. So I believe he was exiled for 10 years and actually went to Persia, who they'd spent all those years fighting. In fact, Pericles was actually a hero at the Battle of Salamis, where was just sea battles against the, um, um, the Persians. Anyway, interesting. These are Doric columns. You see those round? You see the curly hue ones? Those are ionic. The round ones are Doric. Here up here, you have the triglyphs and the metope, which are these little figures here. Uh, anything, those little beasts on the corner, those are called acroterion. If you think about it, terion or therion is the Greek word for beast, and acro means high. So acroterion means beasts on high. So when you see those little gargoyles and, well, they're actually different types of things. They're griffiths, griffins. Griffins on the corner of the um, structure, that's what they are. And yeah, that is me by the columns. Also, interestingly enough, if you notice on these, they bulge out. You see, if you notice, they're bulge out. And that's an optical illusion. Because when the Greeks built the original Parthenon, which is destroyed mostly not because of the old age, the reason it's all crumbled and the, and the actual one in Athens, is because uh, when the Greeks were declaring independence from the Ottoman Turks, uh, there was a battle and some, I believe, gunfire hit uh, 
some gunfire hit, you know, some gunpowder that was stored up in the Parthenon and it blew it up. All right. So a lot of people don't know that. They think it just fell across because of time. That's not true. Um, there's more to the picture. Oh, anyway, I'm sorry. I was going to say on this one, uh, what you have, these bulge out because it's an optical illusion. If you went way up on the hill to look at it, they would look like they were sinking in the middle. So they bulged out the middle to give the optical illusion that when you were standing there looking at it, it actually looked straight. All right, again, I'll show you this one. Oh, there's that Greek pottery I was talking about just real quick. The Amphora, which stores wine. The Palike, which I don't remember quite what that does. I think that also is like wine storage. Uh, the Bell Crater, which is a, a mix. The Kelix, which is a drinking bowl. Uh, and then the, like there's a little Anoike, a picture over here. Different things. This is in the San Antonio Museum of Art. All right, this is what I'm talking about when I get to ancient Assyria. Um, this is King Sennacherib mentioned in the Bible. Very, very cruel. Notice he has a beard. Notice all the guys behind him have no beards. Uh, and they're following. Those are eunuchs. I'm not going to explain what a eunuch is or why there's eunuchs. Um, in case there's kids watching. But, all right, what the heck? You know, we got to grow up sometime. Eunuchs. These are palace helpers. They assist the king. They're eunuchs. They're castrated. They have certain parts removed so that they can never have babies. Now, why would you do that? Well, it makes sense. If the king was all about power, he couldn't have guys running around in the palace that might impregnate either his wife or someone else and have a child that would rise up and seize power for the king. So he has them castrated so they can't have offspring, which eliminates the threat to his power because that's what power-hungry people do. But usually they were very, very, uh, you know, they had a lot of the luxuries in life and they were the king helper. They're eunuchs, they're palace eunuchs, and they help them out. There's assistants, there's administrators, things of that nature. All right, this is uh, armor from the Middle Ages uh, in the New York uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art. When I was in there, I actually saw Henry VIII's armor. What a creep. What a narcissistic bully. Remember, he's the one that uh, wanted to divorce Catherine of Aragon. Um, she was uh, Spanish, his, uh, I believe, first wife because she couldn't have a male child and then married Anne Boleyn and then be beheaded people for not being able to have, uh, have his uh, offspring. He was just a spoiled, petulant, a uh, little brat jerk. And so he created the Church of England because the Catholic Church would not grant a divorce uh, for his first wife. So he's like, forget all y'all, just make my own religion and have them grant it. So uh, anyway, and then the Church of England became the land, long standing Church of Eng uh, England. Uh, same thing, same thing. And then, of course, the Church of England, which is going to be the state church, right? And all of these little religious sects that are actually deviating from that are going to be basically what gives rise to the Americas, right? You're going to have your Puritans, your pilgrims, your separatists, you're going to have your Quakers, you're going to have all sorts of weird and like in between groups that endure in certain uh, time periods. Um, mostly, I believe it was uh, after the English Civil War, right? Um, you're going to have these and then these groups kind of start fading when Charles II is put back on the throne. Anyway, there you go. All right, this is Greek armor, Hellenic armor. This is a Corinthian helmet, you know, the kind of the Spartans. These leg pieces are called greaves. Again, there's your amphora amphora and your breastplates looks pretty cool i need muscles like that there's also different types of warrior helmets this is the sphinx of hat suit i believe she was the only i believe she was the only female pharaoh to ever sit on the throne she was actually part of the dynasty household but tutmost the third was actually too young to rule so she basically appointed herself to the throne and ruled over egypt and tutmost grew up uh, grew up came back and said uh-uh I want, I want that thrown back and drove her away. And then all of the images of her were scratched off, right? All of the images were scratched off because they wanted no record. They wanted to erase her from history. I believe she was the 18th dynasty. This is samurai armor. Uh, this is a, a clan symbol of the different families. The term samurai, samurai which is actually feudal uh, term, uh, warrior of the Middle Ages. There's three different classes in Japan. Basically, you have your samurai, you have your uh, serfs, and you have your daimyos who rule. Then you have your merchant class, which during the Edo period rise up and, you know, the merchants that made money were actually kind of looked down in Japanese society at the time. The, the warriors were, were where it was happening. These were the guys that were answered to a feudal lord called a daimyo. If the daimyo was killed, the samurai didn't have a master, and they were called a ronin, or sort of a freelance samurai. The earlier periods, you see armor, you see arrows, and you see them on horses. If you watch the movies, you'll see what I'm talking about. But the thing is, Japan is not idiomatic to breeding horses, so the horse population basically dies. So you don't have that much of a mounted archer thing anymore. By the time you're into the Edo period, which would later become the capital of Tokyo, the samurai would be almost the thing of a past, where he, he would commit himself not so much to fighting for his daimyo or 
as feudal lord, but rather to poetry and swordplay and training and philosophy, whilst the real class that would rise up were the merchants, the ones who were selling and trading. Formerly they had been looked down on it. Now they're becoming kind of the lifeblood of Japan, which in its own language is Ipon or Nippon. All right, China, the Terracotta Army. You heard about these. They were put here by Emperor Qin, a.k.a. Shi uh, Hongti, uh, the first emperor of China after the Warring States period. He, all these different states start fighting against each other, but the emperor uh, or the state of Qin conquers all these other nations and unifies them. And then Emperor Qin has this, sees himself as this divine mandate ruling over all of these other, ruling over and unifying all of these states. And he has a philosophy called legalism, where he is the divine law, what he says goes, right? Uh, but he had killed and murdered so many people, they said that the, he believed that their ghosts would haunt him in the next life and he needed protection. So he would create this terracotta, there's that word again, terra, terrain, terrestrial, earth, army to protect him, um, to protect him uh, in the afterlife. And it is rumored that every one of these people that were uh, constructed were actually constructed after a real person. All right, so that's about 30 minutes into it. I'm going to stop here, and I'll pick up part two in a bit because that's a long video. All right, have a good one, guys.